Then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee, and a report about him spread through all the surrounding country. He began to teach in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Have you ever walked out of the door, nagged by the feeling that you've left something? You don't remember what, but something undone. Some task you meant to get to, but it slipped through the cracks. And then some mechanism in your brain starts sorting through the possibilities and digging like a dog for a long buried bone. That is what happened to me as I sat down to write this sermon. I have forgotten something, something, not necessarily a big thing. And then I finally remembered. We are in the third week of the season of Epiphany, and I have not yet once talked about Epiphany. Thankfully, I did not make the same mistake during Christmas. So, long story short, while my original intent this morning was to focus on the importance of how we pass our faith stories and our wisdom on to the coming generations, we must explore first things first, and that is Epiphany. Epiphany may be the least familiar of the church seasons to us. It's a little fuzzier than the other seasons. For instance, Christmas, of course, celebrates the birth of Christ, the arrival of God into the world. Lent is a time of preparation and penance. And Easter celebrates the resurrection of Christ, God graciously providing us with salvation. Epiphany, on the other hand, focuses on several events, the coming of the Magi to Bethlehem with their wonderful gifts, the baptism of Jesus in the Jordan River, and Jesus' first miracle, changing the water into wine at the wedding at Cana. If we look up the word epiphany in the dictionary, it will say, and I quote, an appearance or manifestation, especially of a divine being. Well, thanks a lot for that. It's technically correct, but a bit unsatisfying. But if we turn a few pages further, we find out that to manifest means to make evident or certain by showing or displaying. In other words, seeing is believing. So in a word or two, epiphany is the appearance of God in the world as Jesus the Christ. And what the stories of the Magi, Jesus' baptism, and the wedding miracle all have in common is that they show how the power of God is evident in Jesus' life. The Magi see the star in the east and how it proclaims Christ's birth. After Jesus rises from his baptism, the Holy Spirit visibly descends upon him. And Jesus, though seemingly reluctant, does change the water at the wedding feast into wine. All of these events show us that God is powerfully with Jesus and that Jesus is, in fact, the Son of God, the promised Messiah. Yeah. Epiphany goes beyond mere appearances. The season of Epiphany reminds us that Jesus Christ is both fully human and fully divine. This is a great mystery for us. How is the human son of Mary 
also the only begotten son of God. Upon this mystery, the whole of the Christian faith rests. The manifestation of God to the world through Christ is at the heart of our faith. As the gospel writer John puts it, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And so surprisingly, Epiphany stands at the heart of our church calendar. It reminds us to explore the great mystery of faith, and it leads us to celebrate the power of God in our midst. Over the years, as have you, I have experienced a few epiphanies of my own. Not in the sense that I'm a divine being cleverly disguised as Carrie being. Epiphany has another meaning, which is to see the basic truth in the situation, to see the essential truth. For example, I was once reading a book by Robert Fulcham. If you can't remember that name, I bet you remember the title, All I Ever Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. That's Robert Fulcham. In a different book, I think, he writes, good marriages are made by choice. And when I read that, I knew exactly what he meant. For a marriage to be happy, both partners have to choose to make it work. I saw that to be in love with someone, to find them attractive and funny, and to be their best friend, all of that is not enough. A good marriage never happens automatically. Every day, day in and day out, both partners must choose to make their relationship work. So there I was almost 30 years ago now, and I finally, clearly, and fully understood that basic truth. I had an important epiphany. I saw the way things really are. The writer of Psalm 147, it's kind of a tour de force this morning. This, the writer of Psalm 147 also sees an essential truth, and she put it into poetry. And that truth is that God is powerful and that God's power is seen in our world and throughout our lives. The psalmist sees God everywhere in the holy city, in Jerusalem, in the children of Israel and Judah, within peace and prosperity, and in the bountiful harvest. The weather responds to God's commands, sort of lives it out. God gives us snow and frost in the winter and the warm melting winds of spring. And finally, God's power is found in the Hebrew law. And this is what inspired the people of Nehemiah's time. The passage that Rob read. Ezra the priest declares to the people after they have heard a reading of the law, the joy of the Lord is your strength. It's a scriptural way of saying, I'm strong to the finish because I eat my spinach. More eloquently, the psalmist writes, God declares God's word to Jacob, his statutes and ordinances to Israel. The Lord has not dealt thus with any other nation. Oh, and did you notice how neatly all this ties in with the importance of passing on our faith stories and wisdom? It's an epiphany miracle. Actually, I think while Epiphanies are miraculous. They're not that uncommon. Think about it. We are stirred by the beauty of a sunset. We are awed by the vastness of space and the wonder of birth. We find joy in the robin's song. We sense power in thunderstorms. And in a similar way, we delight in a fair and just law. We sense its innate goodness and truth. All of these qualities, beauty, vastness, creativity, joy, power, justice, and goodness, we understand to be part of God. We believe them to be qualities of God and qualities which God gives to God's creation. Think how true this is. During war, we pray to God for peace. At Thanksgiving, we praise God for the harvest. During droughts, we ask for rain. And when our lives are filled with pain or injustice or sickness, we beg God for deliverance. We share the vision of Moses and Ezra and Jesus and the gospel writers that God is powerful, God is real, and God interacts with us in our world and in our lives. A mighty fortress is our God, we sing, a bulwark never failing. 
because Martin Luther told us to. Now, I also think it's fair to ask if Epiphany, the season and the experience, is enough for us and our faith. I've sort of made it sound that way this morning, I know. But I think there needs to be more. Here's the way that I think about it, which I hope is helpful to you. The two weightiest, if you will, seasons of the church calendar are, of course, Christmas and Easter. Easter, most of all. But the bar, the pole that connects those two big weights are Epiphany and Lent. Just like Jesus' life and ministry gets us from his birth to his death and resurrection. Epiphany is one of those places that we can grab onto our faith and try to strengthen it by putting it into motion and exercising it. I tell you what, if you don't like my epiphany is like a barbell analogy, come up with some of your own. Send them on in. I'd love to read them. We move on now to wrapping up the sermon. And I want to explore one aspect of manifestation. Remember that? There's a very fair question that people have been asking forever. And that question is, why doesn't an all-powerful, all-loving, and fully present God do something about all the evils in the world? And the answer, the answer that the manifestation of the holy in the created gives us is this. Well, God does all the time and without stopping. There is a call from heaven to all the people on earth who claim that God is their God, and especially to those of us who claim that Jesus Christ is our Lord. And the call is this, whoever, I'm sorry, whatsoever you do to the least of your brothers and sisters that you do unto God. If we ignore those who suffer from the great and powerful evils in this world, then we are ignoring God because God is with the sick and the poor and the imprisoned and the suffering. But if we respond to that suffering, then we are answering God's call. We can facilitate the healing of others and teach others and feed others and free them and love them. We are doing what God wishes. We are doing God's work. We are choosing to make our relationships with others and with God ever deeper. We in this church are the body of Christ. The power of God resides within us. It is the Holy Spirit who moves us to worship and to pray and to praise God. The Spirit can also move us to act and live powerfully like Jesus did. We are not powerless to confront evil in our lives. No, through Jesus Christ, we are empowered. We are sons and daughters of God, created in God's image, and free to choose to do what God wishes. God speaks powerfully to and through the people of God. The psalmist knew that and celebrated that in her words of praise. Nehemiah and Ezra read God's law to inspire the people of Israel and Judah. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, celebrated God in his life by beginning his ministry and changing the water into wine. Let us, today, lift up our praises share our stories and our wisdom, and especially do some heavy lifting to make manifest God's love for the world. And finally, let us allow the great mystery of faith in Christ to empower us to live as he did and as he does. Merry Epiphany to all and to all, and amen.